The following podcast may contain adult language and an abundance of confusion because we're talking about HBO's The Nevers, episode six. Whoa, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Hey everyone, welcome to the Salty Nerd Podcast. I am your host, Matthew Kadish, filling in for our regular host, Alex, who is out with a brand new baby. Is it a boy or a girl? Boy. Know? It's a boy, brand new baby boy. And with me as always to talk about our weekly recap for HBO's The Nevers, it's my fantastic panel of nerds, uh, Matt Vader 74 Welcome. Greetings, my friend. <laughs> How you feeling about this show? Oh, dude. Um... I don't know. I, <laughs> I don't know. This episode really messed with us. There's a it? lot going on in this episode. This was my favorite episode of the season. Yeah. But I but I mean you guys know I, I haven't really this has been a rough show for me. It's mm. been hard for me to catch on. You to have this. a hard time with most shows. It's not I've true. noticed. Just the ones that you that, guys, we, that we that watch. you guys like. <laughs> <laughs> and with me also is the ambassador of estrogen, Jude Juju. Hello. How are, you, how are you doing? Did this episode mess with you too? Yeah, I wanted to rewatch it and I just didn't have time this week. Um, but there was a lot, like for the first uh, 10 minutes, I was like, what is going on? <laughs> yeah, you were really confused. Yeah. What show is this? They put on a different show and they got the, th <laughs> I the think stuff I made mixed him Because I was like distracted doing stuff and I was like, wait a minute. What the fuck? And I was like, you need to pause it, rewind it, and go back. And yeah. we did, and it still didn't make any sense. Yeah. I was like, no, yep, this is the same show. Yeah, I, like the very opening shot, I was like, oh, yeah, they're jumping out of a spaceship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was weird. I was like, are they the space jizz? They're not. <laughs> they're not. Um, but before we get into this episode, let's take a quick break and uh, hear a word from our sponsors. Everyone, welcome back. So our typical recap review for a show like The Nevers is I'll go through scene by scene and let people kind of come in and comment on it. But because this episode is so different from all the others, so it's broken up into four chapters, and the very opening of this is completely different from uh -huh. what we've yeah. had so far, I'm actually going to explain what the <laughs> opening of this show Could is all you? about. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually sat down researched it, figured everything out, watched it with the subtitles on so I know exactly what they were saying and, and stuff like that. I have some questions before you do that. Okay. Okay. So I know that COVID affected um, the the releasing of this show and how like how much time they had to shoot and, and, and all of that. So uh, was this effect, this episode affected by COVID or did they mean to do this? I'm honestly... Not sure. Okay. I don't know. Your research is bullshit. Well, yeah, <laughs> typically it is. Um, but, uh, you know, the interesting thing about this is that the first, I want to say like, like third of this episode um, doesn't have any of our regular cast members mm -hmm. in it. And I'm thinking that it might have been shot early on. So they had the time to do all the special effects and stuff. Oh. Um, so they might have shot a lot of this stuff before the production got shut down for COVID. Um, I just don't know. Uh, okay. The way TV works is it, it can be very kind of like out of sequence. Usually it's not shot in order. Yeah, but, um, you know, it might have been going on at the same time as the previous episode's production. I just don't know. Um, but one of the interesting things about this episode in particular is that it really reminded me a lot of the Dollhouse finale. Because in, in that other Joss Whedon show, um, Dollhouse starring um, Elijah... Dushku. Dushku. Um, she, or uh, basically in the final two episodes, they flash forward like a decade or something like that. And it, it's become like a Mad Max dystopian type future. Uh, and you're just like, whoa, wh where did this come from? And the last two episodes are just like completely different from what the rest of the series was. And that was because they knew that they were getting canceled. And so they had like a five-year kind of plan for the series. And Joss Whedon was just like, you know what? Since we're getting canceled, let's just make the final episodes like what we wanted to do by season <laughs> five. And so they crammed like like three seasons worth of story into like the last like couple episodes of that show. And um, this had a very f similar feel to it to me in the sense that like they kind of had a, a plan for what they wanted to, you know, show us. And it was very jarring um, because like this is an episode of, of this show that you would have to watch a couple times in order to fully comprehend what it is they're they're trying to tell you i mean by the time we get to the end of this episode 
they tied it all together, I yeah. thought, really well. Yeah. But we need to get there. So. Yeah. Well, the thing that this episode did give me, which I've been hoping for um, this whole season, was like the backstory on Amalia mm -hmm. and and how she got like her her ninja prowess and stuff. So now we we know like kind of we've seen like her her backstory leading up to where we are now. So yeah. I was glad I got that. Well, I think one of my criticisms of this show is that they introduce a lot of stuff early on that didn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, like it makes sense as, as we go along as they reveal stuff. But like, for instance, the last episode where they were referring to the uh, Galanthi? alien as the Galanthi, yeah. there was no setup for that. And so like they, be, because they're in this world and they know what the Galanthi is and we find out that Penance uh, was fully aware of what Amalia's deal was for all the, the first half of the season, basically. Mm -hmm. um, like the characters know what it is. And so they don't need to explain it to anyone. But we as the audience were completely like, what are I they talking so about? I was so irritated. Yeah. I was like, well, who the hell is the Galanthi? And why does everyone, why is everybody acting like I know what it is? Yeah. So I feel like this episode would have probably been better suited to or at least the flashback parts of this episode would have been better suited to an episode three uh, so that we get the backstory of Amalia earlier on. Mm -hmm. And that way we're not as an audience confused going forward. Like I understand why they did it this way. And because this is like a good, like mid season kind of finale type thing. This is episode six, right? Yeah. So, Isn't this supposed to be a 10, se 10 episode season? Yeah. So technically, even though this is the finale of the first season um, because it was shortened due to COVID, um, this is in in the show's writing um, schedule. This is the mid season finale. So well, that would make sense. Yeah. So. Um, but you know, just from a strictly audience confusion standpoint, I feel like this could have come earlier in, in the show's um, airings mm -hmm. and and would have laid the groundwork going forward for what we were going to get mm -hmm. uh, because it did answer pretty much every question we had about yeah. Amalia. Yeah. And her relationship with Malady. Yeah, it was very interesting stuff. Tell us about chapter one, Matt. All right, so chapter one is entitled Stripe. And basically, Stripe is um, this super soldier character that we meet um, in this episode, but it's not actually her name. It's the- Her, the, her title. Yeah, it's the rank of yeah. her character. So like, um, they have a, a special unit that's called a pride. I don't know why they decided to change all this stuff up. Uh, but the leader of that pride is called a crescent. So it's kind of like a lieutenant or a sergeant or something like that. And then um, like, a, like a gunner is kind of like a stripe, like they're kind of like a Navy SEAL or you know something like that. So in the distant future, a group of PDC, otherwise known as Planetary Defense Coalition soldiers, <laughs> airdrop into a destroyed city in response to a spatial anomaly that's been discovered. Earth is going through a civil war between the PDC and the Free Life Army. The planet has been ravaged by ecological and biological disasters, and an alien race called the Galanthi have come to try to save humanity. But the Free Life Army doesn't trust the aliens and wants to destroy them, whereas the PDC sees them as their saviors and wants to protect them. And that's the genesis of this civil war conflict. Of the 20 Galanthi who came to Earth, only one is left alive and is apparently at a science station that's helping it to construct a stable portal to supposedly bring more Galanthi to Earth. The Free Life Army has gotten to the science facility first, but a rogue stripe, aka a specialized soldier, teams up with the new PDC unit to take out the Free Lifers and enter the facility. So um, one of the interesting things about um, the opening of this is our main character, uh, her introduction. She's played by Claudia Black, who, um, you know, she was a, she's like a, a big kind of genre actress. She she was in Pitch Black, and uh, oh. and um, she's all she was also on Stargate SG One for a while, and stuff like that. So like she's kind of like a well known actress, but she's what? almost almost unrecognizable in this episode. She, that's Claudia Black. From. Um Oh my God, I see it now. Yeah. Like, like she, she she doesn't look like Claudia Black. Like, they, they really roughed her up for this episode. She's she's the chick who was, like, in the last two seasons, right? Yeah. And she was also in the show with the other dude from... Yeah, she was in Farscape. Far, okay, yeah. yeah. Farscape I lady. did not recognize her at all. <laughs> I know, right? I'm freaking out right now, dude. <laughs> I am really freaking out. Oh, wow. I just IMDb'd her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, now that yeah, I, I recognize her now. I did not... I don't... 
Well, he yeah. when we yeah. were watching she, it, he she, was like, "Oh yeah, she's." And I was like, "I don't know who yeah, that is." Yeah, she's almost unrecognizable. That's wild. Yeah, yeah in, in, in the show. So, basically, in this bleak future, the PDC believes that names are sacred and they are only shared with those that they implicitly trust. Uh, the PDC unit doesn't trust the new Stripe, aka Claudia Black who escaped a massacre in Edinburgh and played possum by swallowing coolant pods to drop her body temp enough to avoid the scans from the Free Life Army. And she was able to survive long enough to kill 12 of the 20 Free Life marauders uh, who showed up before the new unit arrived. So when we first see Claudia Black's Stripe character, it looks like she's dead. And uh, then we hear like this kind of like... Um, so just, just to clarify, her character is pro galanthi coming in or, yes or not she's she's pro galanthi she's part of the pdc okay army. so we want the aliens to come up. yes yeah we, right. we, we want to help the aliens all right but i i think that her character in particular just doesn't care like that was just the side that she was born on and so like that's right. the side she fights for um but um so when we first see her it looks like she's dead but she's playing possum and she has like a heart respirator that automatically kicks in and and wakes her up and she vomits up these three kind of glowing blue things. And those were coolant pods that were used to drop her body temperature so she could avoid scans. And she basically saves the ass of, you know, this new PDC unit by taking out the marauders who got the drop on them. And so she's kind of like a, you know. She's a badass. Yeah, yeah. She, she, she's a, a true badass. And uh, she's ba Laura Croft, basically. Uh, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> basically, uh, she was in Edinburgh uh, when there was like some type of big massacre. They don't really go hardcore into it, but her and two others survived. And she was the only one of those three that survived the trek down to wherever this is. Cause there's like some type of ecological disaster. It's, it's cold out. It's, you know, toxic, you know, they need to wear like special suits just to go outside. Oh, like earth they, is I, not okay. I thought they were on a ship. No, no, no. Th this is earth. Mm -hmm. um, earth is basically, completely and, uh, okay destroyed. i'm glad you're like letting me know because i was wrong <laughs> about a few things yeah all right so basically uh the the pdc unit doesn't quite trust her but they realize that she's on their side and so like um they accept her into their group because their other um stripe got killed um a while back and had they hadn't replaced them yet so uh this stripe suffers from something called pitsid and they never really explain what pitsid is but i imagine it's kind of like um ptsd um, in a way, uh, but this pitsid causes temporal flashbacks that mess with one's perception of reality. And so when you have pitsid, you don't truly know if what you're experiencing is, is the here and now, because you have these kind of like really um, vivid flashbacks to you know stuff that happened. And, and we see it in this episode where she basically flashes back to how she got the scar on her face and stuff like that. Um, but she befriends the unit's medic, and the medic in, in this uh, is called a knitter, <laughs> K-N-I-T-T-E-R. So like they wait, wait stitch for the him up. to come out. Yeah. Um, uh, and the, this knitter is a former free lifer who was spored by the Galanthi, and basically a spore makes you em em emphatically enhanced, kind of like Deanna Troy, you know, uh, an, an empath. And uh, the stripe jokes that the spores make people wise and adorable, but the knitter says that the spores actually activate parts of the mind needed to comprehend Galanthi language and technology. And so there are, the spores are a way of unlocking the potential of humans to communicate with these aliens. And they don't give you weird powers or anything like that in this future. That's a, a new development that apparently happens when they go back in time. So while exploring the facility, the group finds sim strips, which appear to be related to the Victorian era artifacts that they find in the lab. And, and so these sim strips are basically like these things that you plug into sensors that allow you to have like a fully immersive like virtual reality virtual reality experience exactly um and it's kind of implied that these sim strips that they find are simulations of the victorian era uh, because who, whatever science team was at this lab for whatever reason was studying victorian era 19th century e england basically which is kind of like I, I think that this facility is located in the modern day England, which is basically, okay. you know, close to Edinburgh. Um, is it Edinburgh or Edinburgh? Edinburgh. 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 I don't know Edinburgh. how us Americans say it. Yeah. We say it wrong. <laughs> I say a lot of stuff. I think wrong, it's like so. Edinburgh or yeah. Edinburgh or something like, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the, the knitter jokes that their tech guy who specializes in sim strips 
uh, could kind of review these things and see what's on them, but that he enjoys fuck tech more than any other sim, <laughs> which is basically like, like you know, a, a sim where you're having sex. Yeah. Um, so they, they call it fuck tech. Uh, regardless, it seems that the science facility was not only used to help create a stable portal for the Galanthi, but also to research the 19th century Victorian era for some reason. And there is a theory online that um, what we're seeing with with True and like all the stuff that happened um, in the Victorian era Holodeck. is a sim. Yeah, it's right. like an advanced sim, but it's just a theory. We don't know for sure. Um, the group finds a living Galanthi in one of the labs that was being tortured by the free lifers by forcing it to endure the killing of the science team that it had bonded with. And so these Galanthi are kind of like benevolent aliens and they've come to try to help save humanity because um, I think they said in, in this part that 5 billion humans died because of all the ecological disasters on the planet. And so the aliens look at humans as, you know, kind of like pets, I guess. And they, they want to help them. They want to care for them. And, and so um, this one Galanthi that was working with the science team bonded with, you know, all the members and was kind of like, you know, th their mascot, their friend type thing. And uh, when the free lifers came in, in order to kind of torture the Galanthi, uh, in order to extract its hope for humanity, they killed the science team in order to make it despair. And they had it like at the bottom of this shaft where the blood from the science team would like fall onto it. And people were like, why were they trying to feed it blood? And it's like they weren't trying to feed it blood. They were trying to like drown it in blood. Well, not necessarily drown it, but just make it wallow in the blood of the, these sad. people that, yeah, make it sad. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so That's these, th weird. these free lifers are real pieces of shit. Yeah. Um, so the tech guy discovers that the team accidentally initiated the Galanthi's power buildup when they entered the facility and that the Galanthi is actually preparing to leave as the stable portal is actually an exit, not an entry to their planet. So the spatial anomalies that these Galanthi have come through in the past humanity sees them and they think oh more galanthi are coming and when they saw this this um, stable spatial anomaly above the planet they thought that it was an invasion for more galanthi to come through and even the pdc don't fully trust the galanthi because they don't really know a whole lot about them so they're like you know these first 20 could have been scouts and the ne next group that comes through could be like an invasion force or something like that so what they discover is that this portal actually, the reason nothing's come through it is because it actually is an exit. It's meant to go somewhere as opposed to bringing something in. And after being betrayed by a member of their team, Stripe is forced to watch Knitter die. And, you know, Knitter is someone that she bonded with over the course of like this little adventure. And um, she actually kind of gave her a little bit of hope about the Galanthi because before like Stripe was just kind of like a very mercenary. She didn't really care about anything. And the knitter being spored and having some type of connection with the Galanthi was able to share with Stripe the, the message of hope that they were bringing. And so knowing that the Galanthi is preparing to leave and feeling despair at the loss of her friend and the fact that this alien race is getting ready to abandon humanity, Stripe decides to commit suicide by drinking coolant pods or ODing on some type of medicine. I wasn't quite, they, they weren't sh very clear on what she was drinking, but it was obvious that she was trying to, to end things, like she wanted to die, which is a parallel to what was happening with Molly mm -hmm. back in the Victorian era. So as Stripe is dying, the energy form of the Galanthi, which was powering up in order to go through the portal, passes through her and rescues her consciousness before she's able to actually die. So it kind of hijacks her her brain basically okay. as it passes through now, her. Now it's yeah, sense. I had questions yeah. about that. So the, the Galanthi takes the, the stripes um, consciousness with it and as it flies into the air, you can see it transform into the shape of the jizz ship from episode <laughs> one. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it's basically going it's preparing to go through the portal and it's carrying the, the stripes consciousness with it as it does so. And so that come, brings us to the end of chapter one. So did that make sense to you guys? That makes more sense now. I still have questions that I will have to think of later. I do want to rewatch this episode. Yeah, I, I do too now. Um, it was interesting. I remember when I turned this thing on, I was like, this is, they've, they've screwed up the, the programming <laughs> at, at, at HBO Max. I'm watching a, I'm watching a different show. 
They got some weird Doctor Same. Who thing going mm-hmm. on right now. I don't know what's going on because <laughs> it was so completely different yeah. that it really it, it was very it jarring. With me. It was yeah. very jarring. Yeah, yeah. But um, I, you know, when I was watching, I was like, Vader's probably going to really like this episode because it finally went full sci-fi. Yes. Yeah. 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 It's my. It's by far my favorite episode of this show. And it's just because they got super weird. I guess I don't know. Very sciency. Yeah. Yeah, Jude. What did you think? Did Did my explanation make more sense? Yeah. All right, so now we're moving on to chapter two, which is entitled Molly. So now we're back in London prior to the Galanthi's appearance, and we're watching Molly, aka Amalia True, working in a bakery and dealing with getting fired, getting married to an oblivious lout, and going through <laughs> two miscarriages in short succession. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, they really like laid it on thick with her. Yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, well, no wonder she Poor jumped Molly. off the bridge. Okay. Yeah, they, they really kind of accelerated um, the, the time lapse in, in this because like she goes from being kind of like a young like baker's assistant to getting married to having like two miscarriages mm-hmm. and, and like the husband's just treating her so awful and, like, the, and, the, and the old decrepit mom yeah, taking care of the, the husband and taking the, care of the, the, the mother so molly uh, this was this was kind of heartbreaking for me because like we see who she is now and here's her backstory which is she is a young baker's assistant and she's like bright-eyed and and hopeful and she has a crush on this boy who comes into the the bake shop and the owner of the bakery is like he doesn't have money for marriage you shouldn't marry him you should marry this guy who has a crush on you who it, like he's awful he's from the butcher. beginning yeah. yeah he's just like gross and like you said he's a lout i don't know what that means but i feel like it's <laughs> apt um so she decides you know i'm i'm not gonna uh, wait for this man who i actually want to marry i'm just gonna marry the the stable choice and he's awful and she like has miscarriage after miscarriage and he's awful about that he's like hey you better give me a namesake. I mean, this is the second one you've lost. Like he's so rude and awful yep. and gross. And then he dies. Yeah, and then he dies <laughs> un, like completely unexpectedly, and Amalia gets stuck taking care of his um, bedridden mother. Um, and then by the by the end, she's just like so downtrodden. She's she's lost her job at the bakery, and she ha- she's alone. She's widowed. She's taking care of this old lady. And so she just jumps off of a pier and they pull her out as the stripe and put her in a loony bin. uh, Okay. So basically the husband dies of an unspecified illness and there's like a plague going around. Yeah. And true is basically left to care for her sick mother-in-law. Uh, and the only earnings that she makes is based off of like the pennies that she makes delivering bread for the bakery that she used to work for. And uh, she learns that the man who fancied her is married and expecting a child. And he's like got money now and he's successful. And she's like, that's the life I could have had if I'd have trusted myself and yep. not this dumb bitch baker. Yeah. <laughs> and so like one day, uh, like she, she goes and she delivers some some treats to the, the guy who got away, basically. And that's the day where she decides while she's out on her bread run that um, she's going to end her life. Mm-hmm. And she goes and she jumps into the Thames mm-hmm. River. And we've seen bits and pieces of this uh, throughout earlier parts of the season where, you know, she's kind of, she looks like she's dead in the water and she's just kind of floating there. And then when the jizz, magic jizz kind of rains down. Spores. Uh, alien jizz. Yes. Spores. A- alien jizz spores. <laughs> God, yeah. uh, <laughs> um, you, you know, she wakes up and she kind of swims to the top and we think that that's Molly, but Molly is basically dead. And they explain that the reason that the Galanthi chose to put the stripe into Molly's body was because Molly had already passed away. Yeah, and, she was done using it. Yeah, so like she, the, the Galanthi actually didn't kill anyone, um, but it was, the, the body wasn't quite dead yet. So, you, you know, she was able to, the Galanthi was able to rescue it for the stripe. And the next time we see um, Amalia, she's being brought into a psychiatric facility and um, it's not the Molly we've come to know. It's actually the stripe from the future inhabiting her body. I thought this was really well done because it's so different. She's like, I'm Molly and I'm in a bike shop. (laughs) And then she, she's like, she's like, what am I doing here? Yeah. She's speaking it with an American (laughs) accent. Yeah. It was so good. So well done. Yeah. It's like, why am I so short? Why is it going Why are my hands so small? (laughs) (laughs) 
All right, so chapter three is called The Mad Woman in the Thames, and the new Amalia True is disoriented as Stripe comes to grips with her new reality, which she thinks is a simulation at first. So when she's in the psychiatric facility, she, she's like, I'm in a sim. Mm-hmm. This has to be a sim. And uh, Sarah- They just start beating her. <laughs> yeah. Sarah, who will become Malady, uh, starts talking about sparks that she saw um, falling from a dragonfly-shaped ship that she thinks is God. Uh, True can't figure out why she's not dead and laments that she has no mission. Uh, she's the only person in the asylum who believes Sarah about what she saw because she knows about the Galanthi. And this bonds the two of them. And so this goes back to episode two where we have that face-off between True and, and Sarah. And True realizes, oh, this is, the, this is the girl that was in that facility with me. She did her dirty, though. Yeah. And we're going to actually get to see that happen in, in this episode. So then we were introduced to Dr. Cousins, who is the facility's physician. And, uh, you know, it, it was kind of funny because when True first sees Dr. Cousins, she has a, a flash forward like to her them first having one, sex. right? Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I mean, in, in her life in the future, she was having flashbacks. But now that she's in the past, she's having flash forwards, which I thought was kind of interesting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And if you notice in, in, uh, episode, in chapter one, Stripe is doing that finger thing yes. that Amalia does uh-huh. before she gets like those flashes, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, but um, so she has like a flash of her having sex with Dr. Cousins. And it's kind of funny because she's like, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> like when she comes out. She of has it, a very physical like, woof. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and Dr. Cousins is like, oh, well, if you'd rather not have a black doctor, she's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> Get your ass over here. Well, I thought that was interesting because it's the first time that this show is actually kind of addressed like race and and class, Mm -hmm. um, you know, structure. And, uh, because before it was just like, Oh, Dr. Cousins, he's black. He's walking around like it's, it's nothing. But, um, so this is our first taste of like a little bit of that 19th century realism, Mm. which I thought was kind of interesting where it's like, if you prefer not to have a black doctor, I can bring someone else in. She's like, Oh no, 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 this, this is fine. Um, yeah, I I want that black doctor and I want that (laughs) black dick too. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) Um, so basically, uh, after that flash forward, um, Amalia gets slashed by one of the inmates who's having like an episode where she's like, she got like a, a sharp blade and, you know, she's like threatening to kill people. And Amalia being the super soldier that she is, is able to disarm her, but she kind of gets cut in the process. And uh, Cousins basically tries to, you know, um, sew her up, but he discovers his turn, which is his ability to heal. And he basically becomes True's confidant. And uh, basically, we, we learn that in her experience, the spores don't always affect everyone they hit, but they also don't usually cause random powers to manifest. So this is kind of new for her. But she fills Cousins in on, you know, all the backstory of the Glanthi and, and, you know, spores and stuff like that. And she thinks that the powers thing might be a side effect of the torture that the Glanthi yes. experienced. Yeah. And she also laments that there's no one to lead all the people who've been affected because usually the Galanthi kind of appoint a leader uh, to kind of shepherd the the people that, you know, they're, they're trying to help. And um, basically cousins suggest that True might be the one that they chose to be the leader. And she gets mad because she wonders like, you know, like I'm not a leader, you know, like I can't even get much done. Like this body's too small and frail, <laughs> you know? Uh, and so, um, she'll take care of that. Yeah. So basically, uh, with that in mind, she kind of starts getting to work on getting herself in order. She starts working out and trying to you know, strengthen doing herself. Some push-ups. Yep. Doing Exercise some, montage. Yep. <laughs> and, uh, she practices speaking with a British accent and learns to do her hair and carry herself like a proper lady. And meanwhile, cousins brings uh, her newspaper articles about, touched people who are showing up around town. And uh, then uh, we get the scene where Dr. Hogg comes poking around or Hogue. I don't, I don't know. He's he's the creepy doctor, the lobotomizer. Yeah. He's the American doctor from American horror story. (laughs) Yes. Never trust this guy. Never trust that guy. But it was interesting that he was here. It's not a voluntary study. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, It was interesting that like he was here this early on in in the storyline. Yeah. And so he comes poking around. And he that wa- cousin, he and cousins worked together. Yeah, he might have been the other doctor that uh, he was talking about. Mm-hmm. So that was kind of interesting. Anyway, so Dr. Haug, I'm just going to call him Haug, <laughs> uh, comes poking around wanting to know about the lights in the sky, that story that Sarah was you know, kind of talking about. And uh, because obviously he knows that, uh, you know, something crashed and he's probably already found it by now. 
Um, but True points him towards Sarah and then cousin and then counsels Sarah to tell him what you saw. He's going to help you. And this was obviously Sarah or uh, True trying to throw Haug off the scent because she recognized him as a threat. Mm-hmm. And so he basically threw Sarah to the wolf, or she threw Sarah to the wolves. And um, that was the beginning of Malady. Yeah. Which was interesting. And then finally, um, we get Lavidia Bidlow showing up. And this is after True's um, kind of like, I guess, disciplinary hearing or like whatever well, the hearing is to release like, her. Yeah, she was going to this hearing to decide if she was like sane enough yeah, to, to, to leave the asylum. But because she is so adept at dealing with all of these people in the asylum, they don't want to let her go because she's basically well, free labor. Well, well, we kind of got the impression that something happened at the... Uh, at the, at the hearing that they so, didn't tell yeah, us about. Yeah, so basically... She's beat the shit yeah, up. Yeah, and she's in yeah. a padded room. Well, I just assumed that they told her, you're not getting out of here, and she went berserk. No, so what happened was, it's kind of unclear because you could tell that they had to cut out a lot of stuff um, for this episode to just fit it in, into an hour. So this could have been explained better, but basically um, she went in front of the... Um, kind of like the, the board. parole board eva- yeah. evaluation board. Yeah. And I, th- I believe that she attacked them because she didn't want to leave because she had nowhere else to go. Gotcha. And she, she knew that they weren't going to let her go anyway because she's, um, she was basically running the, the asylum and keeping all the inmates in check. And so it, it didn't make sense for them to like release her and knowing this, she was like, I'm just going to go in there and mess them up, and th- which is why she was in a padded cell. And that also got her the attention of Lavidia, who shows up. And after kind of figuring out that, you know, she's not crazy and she's actually really good at handling people with these new powers, she asks her to run her orphan. She gives her a place to go. She gives her a mission, which is what Stripe has wanted, you know, since, the, since showing up here. Um, so since she has no mission and nowhere else to go, True agrees, uh, agrees to work with Lavidia despite her misgivings. So that was chapter three, The Mad Woman of the Thames. What did you guys think of this section? I was into it. I was uh, really digging all of the backstory that we got, especially on Malady. Like how sweet she is in the asylum and how just like naive and she believes everything. And she's like, oh, go tell that evil doctor what I know. Okay. And then he's obviously the one that turned her into Malady. Obviously, yeah. Vader, what did you think of the section? Good, good times. I had a, I, I enjoyed getting the backstory. Yeah. I, I, I enjoyed it. Because we got things explained to us, you know, it give us, it, it, it this is kind of where I like started thinking maybe I do like this show Aww. a little bit, you know, um, it got me a little more invested into the character, I think, if that makes sense. Yeah. So, yeah, it got us more invested in the character, but it also kind of showed us the greater world building Yeah. that has existed since the episode one, but they were kind of like slow, like, slow feeding us. Yeah. Right. And now they were just like, boom, just dumped it on. Which, yeah. which is why I, 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 I enjoyed this episode the most of all of them that we've gotten so far, I think. So, How yeah. many chapters are there? There's one more. There, there, there's four. Okay. So we're, we're at the last chapter called true. And now we're back up to, you know, now we're at the mission. Yeah. About we're, from last where week. we're at. Yeah. yeah. We're, we're, we're at current time. So cut to True's group in battle with the soldiers um, during their mission to find the Galanthi. So they thought the soldiers would be out at the hanging, but it turns out there was a group that stayed behind. So we go right into them having a fight with Bonfire Annie and and um, even Augie is kind of getting in on the, yeah, on the action there. good for you, Augie. And uh, as they're fighting, Amalia falls into the hole that they dug uh, using tr- uh, Penance's kind of like digger tool. And she's separated from her group and she then goes into Dr. Haug's lair to find the Galanthi chrysalis. And she has this kind of funny thing. It's like, you're always up in the ceiling. You know? <laughs> so I thought it was kind of funny. Anyway. Um, she has her little heart to heart moment with the Galanthi. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just her in, in the lair and uh, she wonders why the creature is hiding. And then she has a flashback to her life as Stripe and then her life as Molly. And then um, she kind of falls backwards off the platform after being overwhelmed by these kind of parallel life flashbacks. Didn't she already know that she was the stripe? Yeah. Yeah. But, but 
she had flashbacks of her life as a strike, kind of like seeing your life flash before your eyes. Oh, okay. But then she also got flashbacks of Molly's life, the life of the body that she inhabited. Um, So we see a flashback um, where uh, she basically told Penance about the future and the Glanthi and everything like that. And uh, Penance (laughs) Penance was like, oh, yeah, it's cool. Sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. Penance is very (laughs) on board. I was like, let's do this. (laughs) Yeah. And Penance basically just says like, you know, the future that you came from, we're just going to change it. That, that's going to be our life's work. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which I thought w- w- was, was pretty cool, but She's we also. She's so hopeful. I love penance. <laughs> yeah. And, and penance is like, I think true actually said it in this episode, penance is her heart. Yeah. You know, and she had to leave her, like leave her heart behind in order to go find yeah. the Galanthi. So what I like about penance, and, and this is just like an example of really good, um, a, like being really good at, at developing characters and writing characters that are um, alike but very different, and um, there are a lot of similarities between Penance and Mal- Sarah. Sarah, um, whereas they're both like really hopeful and 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 bright eyed and and full of this this hope, but whereas um, Penance is very realistic and not naive, and Sarah is very naive, and that's the difference between them and why Penance it. it she doesn't um she doesn't fall into any traps but sarah does and then you know hijinks and soon she becomes this evil villain Mm -hmm. and uh one of the interesting things about this flashback is we we got to see like some images of of nick frost the beggar king yeah um so like he's got something going on there um so like it was all very cryptic what this flashback was but we hear someone say did you think you were the only one who hitched a ride and then we see Myrtle, the girl who has like all the languages in her head, and she's dressed up in very modern garb. And she yeah, says, "She looks like from the future." Yeah, and she says, "Oh, Amalia, um, this is a long time from this little cave. This I will need you to forget." And so you're like, "Is is Myrtle speaking for the Galanthi? Is this something the Galanthi is doing to like?" Wipe I'm, I'm completely lost to what you're talking about right now. So part it's like, it's like I must have missed that part of the show or in something. A, in her in her vision that she was having. Yeah. So as she was falling back off the platform uh-huh. you know, when she found the Galanthi, she had like this these series flashes. of flashes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And basically, um part of the flashes was with Myrtle, who is the girl who speaks you know, all the languages. Speaks all the different languages, okay. right? And she speaks directly to Amalia in her vision and says, I'm gonna need you to forget this. And so the question is, is that the Galanthi speaking through Myrtle to Amalia? And is, is, is he wiping her I gotta her start memory? watching these things twice before I can <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, defi- I definitely think that um, she's she's got maybe a hitchhiker in her. And in, in this vision, um, I think it was the, the Galanthi or maybe someone else from her time because mm-hmm. she doesn't have an accent. And she looks completely different, obviously. Yeah. And one of the interesting things is, is that when they say, um, you don't think you're the only one who hitched a ride, um, like I'm wondering, did any of the free lifers Same. come back? Yeah. Like, are, are there any people from the future that are on the oh, opposite maybe, maybe side? He's in, maybe he's the big bad rich dude. You mean Lord Masson? Yeah, 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 so, yeah. So like, I can kind of see how like Lord Masson's little cabal of rich white guys are, is the mm-hmm. start of the free life. Yeah. Because he's always talking about like a war. And he's imprisoned his own daughter. Yeah. So uh, the question is, is like, who is the other hitchhiker? Yeah. Or is there more than one? You know, so like. Is I, there I, more than two? Yeah. Yeah. So like, you know, who who knows how many yeah. uh, came back through yeah. that portal? So is, is there is there an actual, um, what do they call them? The alien thing? Galanthi. Is there a Galanthi in that? Yes. crystal ball yeah. that's under the ground yeah it's the galanthi that was in that With lab that was being tortured cthulhu looking thing right yeah yeah it was the galanthi that was in that lab that was being tortured in the future and he's the one who came back in the shape of the jizz ship and crashed and so okay. basically from what i've been able to gather from what uh, dr haug has said is that it's going through a metamorphosis of some type hmm. um which means that it's it's no longer going to be the galanthi that that we kind of know about Instead, it's going to be um, something different that, okay. that we're not clear about quite yet. But it hasn't like hatched yet. Yeah, correct. This okay. episode answered so many questions, and then it created a bunch more. Yeah. But I think I think that's that's kind of what makes a show well, really yeah, interesting. That's what, that's what it should do. Yeah. yeah so that, like, that, we, that's we got, what a finale is meant to yeah, do. Yeah, yeah. 
So, all right. So basically we, we get that flashback when Amalia hits the ground, she sits up just in time to see Haug's fucked up face men run in. And it was kind of funny because she like had a flash forward of that happening. And she's like, Oh, that was quick. <laughs> <laughs> like she saw something that was just about to happen. Um, so all the fucked up face men run in, uh, she fights them off and hops in a lift and she's aided by the powers of the lobotomized touched girl who can levitate stuff. Yes. Yeah. So like she made a little appearance to help save Amalia, uh -huh. which I thought was interesting because. And they, they tied that in too. I thought that was really well done. How like we got her like trying to flee from the bad men and then she gets abducted by these bad men and then she gets lobotomized. But then we got like a couple of episodes ago, she, her powers are starting to come back. Well, also like, ever since she got lobotomized, we've seen her working in the excavation of the Galanthi. Right. And we've gotten hints that the, the Galanthi is actually like, you know, reaching I out to her. I thought that was the same actress that played the doctor chick in the first chapter. The doctor chick? Doctor chick? The, the one that... Oh, the, the, oh. the knitter? The knitter. No. It's not the same girl? No, it's either. not the same girl. No. All the people okay. in the future died. So like, they're not the same. Right. I just, um, she looks similar to me. Yeah, she, she, she did. But this is the character we got introduced to in, in episode two, where she was working at the department store right. and she touched stuff and it would just like I said, I've only seen this episode one time. Yeah. So, so, uh, basically, um, she helps true escape and, um, once, uh, outside true re re reunites with the battered and bloodied, uh, members of her team, uh, who help get rid of the remaining people who were chasing her and they like take off. And so now we're back in the orphanage courtyard where everyone is a little worse for wear. True says that even though penance didn't save Malady, she's glad that, that she at least tried. And she reports that they didn't find out who their enemy was, but that it's time to tell the girls everything about the future of the Galanthi, the fight that's coming because it's all coming soon. And then True, whom we know held her real name as Precious Information when she was the Stripe. She even had a line where she's like, I've been married three times. I didn't tell either of them my name. <laughs> um, uh, she finally tells Penance her real name. And she said her name is Zephyr Alexis Naveen. Zephyr. Zephyr. It's a cool name. Yeah. And that's kind of where the episode ends. Uh, we see like Penance's little like um, es escape. Rocket powered yeah. Zeppelin. <laughs> yeah. Her rocket powered Zeppelin just kind of like you know, fly out and she's like, oh, these prototypes. Yeah. I think she says fucking prototype in yeah, every episode. Yeah. Does she really? I think so. Huh. Uh, that, uh, that, that would be something to check. All right. So that is the season finale, mid season finale, however you want to talk about it. Uh, what did you guys think of episode six entitled true? Uh, well, now that I understand it more, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> I really wanted to rewatch the episode because I was just so confused the first time I watched it that I don't think that I was paying attention enough. So I wanted to like get through it once and then do a, do a rewatch, but I just didn't have time. So I'm, I'm glad that you uh, broke it down for, for us dummies over here on this side of the table. Uh, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I still really like this show. Yeah. Vader, did this episode change your perspective? So I was like, I'm, I was pretty much out on this show. I was, I was, I was kind of like, eh, you know, whatever, this show is kind of just another thing. And okay. <laughs> but um, it brought me back. I'm curious now what's going to happen in the future. I will definitely be tuning in when this show starts back up. So then, and, and it's only because of this episode. Okay. So this so episode saved this show for it, you. It did to this point. Yes. Okay, cool. For sure. All right, guys. Well, that's our recap for the nevers episode six. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, Vader, where can they find you? <laughs> You can find me at Matt Vader 74 on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube, and probably a few other social medias that I don't use a whole lot. All right. So and, come, and, come look. and Jude, where can they find more about you? You can find me at I am Jude Juju on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. And I am Matthew Kadish. You can find me at Matthew Kadish, K-A-D-I-S-H on Twitter, and kadishbooks.com will take you to our Amazon page. Guys, thank you so much for being on this journey of season one of The Nevers. Hopefully, when the second half of the season comes back, you guys will join us for more of our breakdowns and this show will get better and better. And uh, as always, stay salty, my friends. See you later.